Welcome to a Roy Branson Legacy Sabbath School doubleheader. Uh, so from 10.30 to 11.30, we will hear from John Jones on the phenomenology of religion. And uh, from as soon as possible after that, we will move into the presentation by Deborah Horn on the travels of the people leaving Egypt and heading to Canaan. If they did, right? If they did. So that's what we're going to find out. A lot of people think they didn't do it, but we're going to find out about that. So thanks to Dr. Brandstater for making that possible. Now, uh, I asked Dr. Jones to give these two presentations on the phenomenology of religion because we've had a several presentations in this class that reported on unusual things, things that are at least unusual from the point of view of most of us. And I had the feeling that some of us were a little bit too gullible and some of us were a little bit too skeptical. And I thought that maybe uh, the phenomenology of religion approach, which uh, Dr. Jones is a specialist in, would help us to avoid both of those, both of those <laughs> errors. What are the three most important words for the phenomenology of religion? Bracket. Bracket? Bracket? Bracket. That's right. Those three words. Now, we talk about meaning, we talk about patterns, we talk about trying to understand this from the inside. Remember when Dr. Jones talked about seeing a man in China paying respects to the, his uh, ancestors, and instead of judging it good or bad, right or wrong, he asked the man first, what is the meaning of what you're doing? That's, that's what we want to do first. All right, so uh, Walla Walla College, Andrews University, Vanderbilt University, perfect credentials. Let's begin with prayer. Dear God, thank you for John. Thank you for his ministry to us as a scholar, as an administrator, and as a friend. Help us to learn from him again today. Amen. Good morning, friends, and thank you, David. Thank you for the chance to do this. I've never had occasion to, to do something like this on the phenomenology as such before, so um, I'm, I'm grateful to you, and grateful to you folks for sitting through this. This is step two now. We did this a few weeks ago, and um, we'll uh, kind of pick up the pieces and try to keep it going. Um, uh, audio, video, all that coming through okay. All right, thank you. So, last time, you remember, we kind of left ourselves hanging at the end of our presentation, of our conversation, because we were looking, as, as David has so well recalled and uh, refreshed our memory, we were looking at a particular way of um, understanding how religion works in other people's lives. Um, the big uh, PH word, phenomenology, really, you will recognize immediately that it's a way of coming at religion through the eyeglasses of the disciplines that make up all of knowledge on our university campuses and in our daily lives today. That is today to say looking at the phenomena from the Greek word um, that means that which is revealed, something that's visible, um, yeah, visible evidences, if you please. That already moves us well beyond the world of the Middle Ages, in which truth was one truth, capital T, but it was apprehended through divine revelation. There we, it's hard for us to turn loose of those medieval perspectives and sort of let them go and wave them bye-bye as we move on through history for the one particular reason that it was holistic. In the Middle Ages, it all fit together. And we as holistic Adventists have a natural instinct to want to work that way. And so we find great attractiveness about the perceptions and the realities of an earlier era. Indeed, when our students struggle with their own apprehensions of faith, 
they're often well-meaning people who want to rush in and say, well, you, 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 need to, you need to read this book, study these doctrines, whatever. But it is so regularly recommended, perhaps without realizing that it comprises a backward step back into that integrated world for which we hunger, but for which we need to ask ourselves, can we ever really put Humpty Dumpty back together again? You know the problem. And so one way of several of coming at this problem and trying to pick up the threads and pick up the pieces is indeed the phenomenological approach um, as a way of joining the conversation of truths, plural, because we live in a world of so many different truths today, don't we? Um, yes, there's real news and fake news, there's that problem, but in addition to that, walk across any campus, either where I work down at La Sierra or this campus or UCR or Cal State or what have you, even if it be a parochial uh, institution that is operated by some faith uh, organization, you will still see the department of, and you can fill in the rest of the title, can't you? Whether it be physics or astrophysics or biology, chemistry, psychology, political science, sociology, yeah, literature, so forth. Where does religion fit into that conversation when, after all, the Latin word religio means that which binds, and that can mean that which binds things up together into one whole. It can mean that which binds us as we try to negotiate our way through life, right? It, 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 that knife cuts in several directions. So we talked last time then about the possibilities and potentials for ways in which we can help our students. I've chosen to couch this particular a uh, couple presentations alongside the issue of how young people are to establish and live within and grow within their own religious traditions. How we on campuses like this, as well as down where I work in Riverside, to find ways of somehow making religion click along with all the other cliques and cliques of the campuses on which we work, you understand. So uh, that's kind of a double task, a double project. Last time we looked a little bit more about phenomenology. This time, let's see if we can bring that discussion home to its potential applications and values in our time today. Along the way, <coughs> we la looked last time at what we've gained and what we don't gain through phenomenology. Uh, we gain ways of joining the conversation with other disciplines that are evidence-based. That's an advantage. We think it's an advantage to be able to help students think of their religion as a religion among religions. We think there's something healthy about that in and of itself. That doesn't make phenomenology the be-all and end-all or the total answer to everything. <coughs> David has helped us remember this morning that there are things where it falls short. There are times when it doesn't answer the questions we want to ask. Are there angels? Ask a phenomenologist about that, and you'll usually get something like, well, mm, let me tell you about the history and development of the concept of angels. And they'll take you back to ancient uh, Mesopotamia, where we see them first emerging in the Old Testament, and so forth and so on, and the word means messenger, and, and they were understood, and, 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 and they'll tell us the whole popular evolution of the thing. But that's a dance around the core question that we want to ask. Phenomenology dances well. It doesn't always answer authoritatively. In a way, that may be threading the needle between maybe too gullible on the one hand, even a little too skeptical on the other hand. We'll see what we can do with that today. And so the question then becomes a double one. First of all, a question of um, re reserving judgment and not rushing in 
to judge from my perspective, but rather the perspective of the practitioner, as we've been reminded here this morning. Secondly, it becomes a matter of interpreting new directions that move in the direction that our students want to move, which is not back into the Middle Ages, but forward. And what does that forward mean for them? I would suggest it goes something like this. David Hukama, professor of philosophy um, at Calvin College in Ann Arbor, he just died, um, raises for us the, that question when he, when he says, look, um, <clears throat> the typical college proclaims its lofty goal of building responsible citizens and nurturing the sense of moral and social accountability. That sounds like religious development to me, right? Um, uh, only in the first few pages of its catalog, right? While its actions carry another message, it might be summarized thus. We have excellent scholars for our faculty. We maintain a good library. We fill the flower beds for parents' weekend. And we sincerely hope that the students will turn out all right. <laughs> That's kind of the quandary in which we find ourselves today. So if we look at some quick examples of where we go with that, how do we fill that slot? We have already indicated, and I'm going to click through these very quickly now, uh, simply in a graphic way, the uh, religious truth seems to be marginalized in the conversation of evidence-based disciplines on campuses. Right, you can see that, I've kind of tried to sketch it a little bit. This is oversimplified, of course, and I'm painting with a very broad brush here, but you get the idea. And there's always that temptation to pull back to the Middle Ages again in order to answer the questions of religious truth, but that doesn't help us in conversation with biology, chemistry, psychology, history, and all the rest, right? So you see the problem. Now, given all of that, phenomenology does begin, and I've used a dotted line, to edge the way into conversation with the other disciplines precisely because it does deal with phenomena much the same way other disciplines do. Ergo, here we go. Um, the hope to di for our purposes today, then, is to see if we can move beyond, not backward, but move forward in a direction of spirituality, which is the big uh, S word, which is so interesting to our students. When I was a college student, we didn't make any difference between religion and spirituality. Indeed, if I had on the campus of Walla Walla College, or any of our other campuses, explained, tried to explain to a, qu a questioner what I was interested in, and I had said, well, uh, spirituality, you know what I would have gotten a very uncomfortable step back and say, you mean like spiritism? You mean like devil worship? Well, no, not exactly. But that was how we lumped them all together in those days. So if you're interested in spirituality back in a previous incarnation, when I was a college student, the way to do that was to prepare for ministry. Because we that was that's the pathway we had and that's how we understood. Other alternative ways of coming at this issue are beginning to emerge. Phenomenology is one of several. And you saw last time or, um, the, the flagellantes in the Philippines, the question of their spiritual value and meaning. And when we ask them to interpret it for us, we see that it's primarily, maybe not exclusively, a matter of loving Jesus so much that they want to identify with him and his suffering. Now, any good Protestant will immediately put another label on that, right? right across the whole picture. Legalism, right? Self-righteousness, winning God's favor, something of the sort. But when we listen to the practitioners, it comes out another way, doesn't it? We've had a chance to see that a little bit. Now, the readings for this time, and I'm, I want to thank those of you who kind of, the, um, uh, we can keep track of these things. It's clear to me that many of you here have tried to delve into these little uh, assignments <laughs> in preparation for these. Thank you for getting those up for us, David, and, and to all of you for, in your busy lives for taking time to do that. Yeah, thank you, Ron. Yes. So, 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 here we are. Um, um, if we back up, let's see, yeah, like this. Uh, obviously, um, when we recognize that the people of the Southern Asia 
subcontinent are very good phenomenologists because they've been observing human nature for many, many centuries, for a long, long time. And in so doing, they have set up, actually, in the Bhagavad Gita, you've got four major ways. I've taken three here um, to get us quickly through this. And uh, you, you've seen this, so you, many of you don't need me to rehash it, but quickly, the way of the heart, um, let's uh, keep this uh, here, the way of the mind, first of all. Uh, this is the cognitive content of religion. This is the head trip, if you please. We Adventists do that pretty well, don't we? Um, doctrines, what they call dharma, what our Catholic friends call dogma, but it's the, it's the, the truth claims of any given religion, and you get at them by going to the library and uh, places like that and studying. Moving right along, um, the way of the heart, the way of the heart in some ways is the difference between our young people's grandparents who sang uh, a mighty fortress is our God um, and many verses all of which had every every musical uh, measure or two had a new phrase this was high content yeah whereas our young people uh, our generation have tended to sing what a friend we have in Jesus <laughs> Our young people want to sing, what a friend we have in Jesus, maybe, but they tend more to sing, our God is an awesome God, and I, I, I'm not disparaging any of the three modalities, I'm simply comparing them. Although one of my colleagues at La Sierra calls praise music 7-11 music, the same seven words repeated 11 times. <laughs> but, uh, that's, that's his, I, I, that's in quotes, okay? <laughs> the point is that Bhakti Yoga, uh, the way of the heart, uh, consists of passionate devotion and love for God. Now out of that can flow loving actions toward um, fellow humans, but it's serving God. Think of, yeah, think of, think of Mother Teresa, who helped a lot of dying people in their last hours and moments of life, but she always explained when I wipe off the mud off the face of this bag of bones that someone has dragged in out of the gutter in Calcutta, you know, ah, that's Jesus' face, you see, I'm doing this for Jesus. That's bhakti yoga. And it consists of chant and dance and what our Catholic friends call the smells and bells of religious experience, you know, all, all of the incense and all, the, all of that as well, for sure. Um, the third one, the way of the hand, karma yoga, is probably the difference between Mother Teresa and Mahatma Gandhi. Now, Gandhi was a deeply religious person too, but uh, he was helping his fellow human beings for the sake of helping his fellow human beings. These are the people you find in, uh, in NGOs um, uh, or training skilled birth attendants, you know, in, uh, in um, Burkina Faso or wherever. Uh, these are the folks with sleeves rolled up making the world a better place, understand. So they're, they're disciplines, three very different disciplines. This all arises, and I'll, I'll just say this in a sentence or two because there are fat volumes and there's a whole journal now of axial age studies, but just in passing, these are the values that, that emerged in Southern Asia 2,000, 2,500 years ago. As the upper top rank, the, the caste of the Brahmins, the priests, lost control of the rituals and the exercises and the memorized uh, gatas and, and uh, writings of the, of the Hindi people and religion. And it, all, it represented a real democratizing of religious experience so that all castes could find ways of deepening their religious experience. These represent popularizations as do two or three others that I haven't listed. But this is a, a, a real watershed 
in the history of the development of religion back in what we call the Axial Age, the great turning point uh, of, of uh, all of the world's great religions, going through a real, a real uh, threshold in time. Now, when we take these and put them out in front of us, we then ask the interesting question, well, what's that got to do with us and how does it help us? And of course, we can put our own New Testament roads right alongside, can't we? Here, are, here is Cleopas on his way down to Emmaus. They're stumbling along on resurrection morning, apparently. Um, totally shattered, devastated. Mysterious stranger comes along and takes them, it says, going back to Moses and the prophets, right? Taking them back through the tr sacred texts and the truths therein contained to say, listen, I've got new perspectives for you. Was it not the case that the Messiah should have suffered these things? And gradually, gradually, they gained insight in that journey down to Emmaus. They, they, they began to see new things, new ways. And finally, uh, when he raises his hands over the Friday or over the uh, Sunday evening meal, um, they see the nail prints and he vanishes. And they say, did not our hearts burn within us as we had this new perception, new perspective opened up for us? That is indeed the way of the mind. This is jnana yoga. Um, moving along quickly, the way of the heart. Think with me, if you will, of the Damascus Road. Paul's uh, momentary shattering experience on the way up to Damascus where from that point on, as long as he lived, every breath he drew, every beat of his heart, belonged to God. This is absolute passionate devotion. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain, because I, the next thing I'll know is Christ in person, face to face. So we see here that kind of absolute, absolute, bond and celebration of a personal relationship to the divine, bhakti yoga. Um, we could say much more, we won't. The way of the hand, good Samaritan, yeah. Jesus commands to love, precisely that, precisely that which cannot be commanded. We say we fall in love, right? Hmm. Jesus says, in effect, let me tell you, act as if you loved and you will begin to love. Right? And this is, this is horizontal now. This is oriented toward fellow human beings. So we find exactly stories that I think the wise mm, preservers of the traditions of Jesus kept and wrote up into their materials because they provided paradigmatic, iconic examples of various ways of being religious. They come into focus for us more when we hold alongside the yogas in the, um, in the, in the um, Hindu tradition. Then we know these stories, but now we see them a little more sharply. The phenomenological approach by way of comparison David has reminded us today that phenomenologists look for patterns. Here are patterns, yeah? And they, they often enrich and deepen our understanding of what it is as we look at religious experience as experience. This then, uh, well, that, there's, a, there's an example from the, from the uh, Southern Asian uh, Hindu tradition. Let's take another one. Um, now this one coming out of the Buddhist tradition there was a, a, a very godly man in northern India, in fact, back sometime 2,300, 2,500 years ago, long name, Avalokiteshvara, I will not be on the quiz, don't even try to write it down, but he was kind of their counterpart of St. Valentine, I suppose, maybe, in our, in our tradition. He was famous for his generous-hearted, open-hearted spirit, loving kindness, compassionate soul that he was. And there are a lot of stories about him. Um, he had a welcoming spirit. He's represented here as Padmapani, the lotus bearer, one who greets you with his hands, 
This hand in this position means come, come to me. This hand in, the, in this position holding a lotus, hey, here's a gift, here's a flower, welcome, you know? There's that kind of genuine open-heartedness about his spirit. Interestingly enough, as his cult moved up through Buddhism from India into China, something else was going on about the same time. We know that at least by the early 600s and probably there's increasing evidence sooner that missionary groups, Nestorians and others, were making their way uh, across the Central Asian Plateau in a journey that was not so different from going to the other side of the moon would be for us today. Yeah, this is really, really something. Uh, at minimum three years to make that journey. You know? Uh, and, and terrific hardships involving the Taklamakan Desert, which being translated means the desert you go into but you don't come back out of. So you can get the idea of the problem. I think, I think the, the nexus for the way these ideas spread and, and <coughs> propagated themselves was the caravansarai. You have trading groups from all over the place going all different directions but they all stopped their caravans periodically uh, and when all well, the camels had been offloaded and watered and settled down um, then they would the the, the, uh, the caravaneers the cameliers would uh, tell stories and share ideas what's the latest what's the latest we we know there are still some places remnants of those uh, caravans are eyes that um, you can still visit in the Central Asian area, in Mongolia, and uh, Tibet, and beyond, uh, still today. Somehow, Christianity was beginning to make its way as well. And about um, in the early uh, two, three centuries after Christ, the, the idea of the Blessed Virgin, um, often represented with a little baby, obviously, the baby Jesus in her arms. I, I simply chose a Chinese uh, representation of her because they're, they go back pretty early. They go back pretty early. And interestingly enough, as the cult of Avalokiteshvara made its way up into India, he, he underwent a sex change operation, it seems, because it turns out to be uh, and, and Chinese and Indians all agree on this, they trace it right back to Avalokiteshvara. The figure whom some of you may know and have encountered as, as Guan Yin. Guan Yin is the Bodhisattva, the Buddhist saint of compassion and mercy, loving kindness, and yes, grace. Grace. We don't know to what extent this is a matter of diffusion, David, of these ideas touching and sh we don't know. But phenomenologists don't need diffusion in that sense. They, they look for patterns and a phenomenologist would say, well, yeah, maybe, maybe. But what this is really evidence is a, of a deeper phenomenon. What is that one? Glad you asked. <laughs> because a phenomenologist would say, look, it represents a common human hunger to know that the universe is in our favor, that spiritual powers are kindly disposed toward us, and that we can cry out for help and get it. The idea of the bodhisattva, too long to explain in detail today, is simply that there are gracious and lovingly kind beings in the world who choose, instead of checking out into nirvana, come back again and again. And you can cry out to them, even if you don't know anything more about them than their name. Just cry out in faith to Guan Yin, or to Amitabha, Amida, or one of the several others, there are many bodhisattvas, cry out in faith, they have merit that they will share with you, they will help you. I'm suggesting that while Christianity is often happy to proclaim itself the only religion of grace in the world, it's simply not true. And uh, we could multiply examples 
certainly Judaism, certainly certainly Islam, Allah is 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 regularly addressed as Al Rahman, Al Rahim, the All Merciful, the Compassionate One. Yeah. We hunger. We hunger for help. We hunger for assurance. We hunger to rise above the shortcomings we all live with and struggle with. We hunger for a female divinity, maternal, loving, and if the Christians needed one, they had Jesus' mother. If the Buddhists needed one, they have the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin. We bend our religions to meet our needs. That's what the phenomenologist would say, you know, rather than necessarily trying to hook it all together um, historically. Um, again, one more, the inner struggle that we all face. What then, Paul says, here is Paul in the quandary. He knows that he's putting people in a strange position. On the one hand, by grace we are saved through faith. On the other hand, that's not an invitation to just shrug off and cheapen the grace by sinning boldly. You see him struggling with that, don't you, in, in Romans. And he's struggling with it because he knows what people start to yell at him in the synagogues. <clears throat> what then, Paul? What of the law? You know? And so, while the letter is not a two-way conversation, he's been in enough two-way conversations that he uses the rhetorical devices to throw into his letter the objections people yell at him before they drag him out and beat him up, you know? So it's time to defuse some of these problems. But on the one hand, should we sin? There's that. And this goes on with us today. It's not 2,000 years ago. This is us. On the one hand, save, once saved, always saved, as our, as our Baptist friends remind us. Oh, well, then all right, you know? Yeah? And the idea is, um, okay, Paul says, just, does that mean run away, cheapen the grace, as, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer would say? By no means. But at the same time, do I struggle on then in my own self-righteousness to gain God's favor and win approbation and get saved? Well, Paul says, no, that's not the answer either. So he's threading a needle here, isn't he? On one hand, should we say, I can will what's right, but I can't do it. Yeah? Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death, as he calls it? Now, he has his answer. Jesus Christ. That's Paul's answer, and it's the Christian one, still for us today. But we still struggle. What does that look like? What? How can I envision this? How do I visualize what that looks like? See? And sometimes it's helpful to borrow an illustration from another tradition and hold it alongside. This is not to make other traditions Christian. Christianity has its own uniqueness, as each religion does. But the fact of the matter is that that great principle in Taoism, Chinese Taoism, of Wu Wei, often translated inaction, that's a lazy, lazy misunderstanding. Not drifting down the river, you know. It's a matter, it's not just, it's just not, it's not a matter of letting the wind take your boat wherever it's easy to blow the sails. A good sailor sets the sails to go where he wants, but uses the wind, you know, but he's not rowing, you know. <laughs> See the idea? So Wu Wei is better translated something like non-forcing, you know, non-awkwardly forcing. That's probably a better translation. And illustration, quick would be maybe, oh, we lost the title. The story, the parable of the wheel maker. Some of you have heard it. There's a long version. You're going to get the short one this morning. There's just a few seconds. The story of the wheel master who lived near to the emperor's palace. This comes out of the Han Dynasty. That's, that's back nearly to the time of Christ. Late Han Dynasty. Um, hauled in before the emperor who was bored one afternoon and told to explain how he gets those wheels right. They said to him, oh, honorable wheel master, we have not yet invented dynamic wheel balancing. We have not yet invented the computer. Uh, how do you do that? How do you get those wheels perfect? Because he's the only one who can put the wheels on the king's, on the emperor's war chariots. Nobody else can get them right. The rest of them, the wheels, 
you know, they're like the supermarket that I get card that I always get. You know, right? <laughs> it doesn't work well in battle. So only this guy can do this thing and get it right, right? So so he oh honorable emperor and he he tries to remember all the hurried quick instructions you've been given how to greet him. Uh, may you live forever and may your concubines keep you ever satisfied or whatever. <laughs> and uh, you ask me how I make these wheels. It's the only thing I do. You say, how do I make these wheels? He said, I'll tell you. I come in early, long before daybreak, and I come to my shop, and already my apprentices have the hire, the fire, white hot, and with the, I hear the roar of the bellows, I feel the heat, I, I see the wood that they've laid out for me, I run my fingers across the grain, much more grainy than this polyvinyl, whatever this stuff is here. I enter into the grain, I feel the grain, I become the grain of the wood. I look at the metal, the steel, I look at the pieces we're going to be working with today, I incorporate them and I pick up my hammer and, oh Emperor, I cannot tell you what I do from that point on. I can't tell you, I can't explain it, I can't even describe it. All I know that is in the in shared energy of the group and the, and the clang and the bang and the sweat. This is Wu Wei. It's not in action, but it's, but it's not fighting with the materials, right? It's, it's entering in and flowing with it. He says, we are all in it together and it feels like dancing. Isn't that interesting? Paul... Paul, can you get there? Paul, it feels like dancing. Can you dance your way through the gospel? In a way, Paul probably would have said, yeah, but it's hard for us. Martin Luther, Martin Luther, in his cell, until his father confessor says, Brother Martin, you've got to ease up on yourself or you're going to kill yourself. Martin, it feels like dancing, you see. Yeah. Quick examples, enough for today. Um, the point is simply is that through these illustrations, we've had a chance to see how when we listen to others and let them describe for us, the answer of how we go from here into a future that is hard for us to envision spirituality out here in front when we try to move forward into that. Our students have a right to ask us, what does that look like and what does it feel like? And it's that point where we can talk about passionate love for Jesus with the flagellantes in the Philippines. We can talk about pathways, the path of the mind, the path of Love for God, a path of service to others. Quick, quick two sentences on that third one, service to others. Pat and I will never forget a young lady whom we met in Nepal from the United States in a death house near to the Brahmaputra River, right alongside, conveniently, alongside the burning guts. This place has people coughing out their guts and uh, with dysentery and all the rest, I don't need to describe it for you. Here she is, along with a few others uh, who are local folks, caring for these people who have been brought by their families to live out their last few days and hours. And uh, she's up to her elbows in blood and gore and uh, trying her best to protect herself. But uh, I asked her, how long have you been doing this? She said, a couple of years. I said, how long are you going to do it? She said, maybe one more year. What are you doing it for? She said, I needed to get my mind off myself. And I knew that this would be a spiritual pathway. I said, is it working for you? Oh, yeah. She said, my problems are nothing compared to that. Yeah. She had that figured out. She was growing spiritually by cleaning up and making the last breaths of these people 
less terrifying for them. I said, what, what group do you belong to? A religious group? No, no. Are you Hindu? No. Christian? No. But this pathway works. Profoundly moved. We find that the hunger for a loving divinity in our lives is met in many traditions. Our need for grace is met in many traditions. We find that the story of the wheel master shows us how it is to dance one's religion from within the core of one's very being. These are not juxtaposed as alternative doctrinal or theological answers, but they are simply held up alongside in a combined and shared pilgrimage, a pathway of spirituality as instantiations <coughs> and illustrations of the various ways in which we can grow spiritually by holding hands and listening to one another. Christianity has much to offer, so do the other traditions. A phenomenologist looks at the ways and the actions and says, hey, we can talk. That in itself is something new for religion in the 21st century. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What are we doing here? It's up to bat first. I'm going to turn this into a testimony meeting really quickly. Um, you know, think of um, the wheel maker and how he described the final process. And then think of how Ellen White described what she did. All of a sudden, something happens. And that patterns all the way around the world. Also, this idea of working really hard and then somehow the breakthrough of grace. You know, Pure Land Buddhism, Amida Bodhisattva, here, here comes God's grace in their way. It's amazing, it's very, very moving to me to see God's grace active all over the world. Thank you, John, thank you very much. Okay, who's first? Over here. I was looking at the uh, enrollment figures for Adventist colleges, and it's not very good this year. You uh, noticed. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and obviously the demographics are not there. The uh, Adventist institutions, like Loma Linda has done, are going to need to expand into a broader market. Yeah. So when you have individuals from many different backgrounds and none, um, one of the purposes, I think, could be to enable each of those students to develop their phenomenology, or we sometimes call it a worldview. Yep. Uh, not just a Christian worldview, but we're here to help you define in your tradition exactly. the worldview that will enable you to yes. live a better life, yes. to contribute to society. I'm wondering if you could comment on that and perhaps the relationship between this concept of a worldview and phenomenology. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a thin slice at some points, but, but let me try. Let me begin, though. No, let me start with the way you put the question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll go with a quick little illustration. Phenomenology defines religion in a number, with a number of qualifications, but the central one is the sense of encounter with the sacred. And that means that whatever is expressed through that encounter becomes then the integrating, unifying force, the core essential uh, yeah, concept, if we want to say cognitively, but of, of reality, of how reality is experienced. Sense of encounter with the sacred locates that right in the organizing center. Now a worldview uh, will do the same but perhaps without the warrant of sacrality endorsing it. And my worldview uh, may be uh, cosmic through my study of astrophysics, 
But it's possible to have a sense of encounter with the sacred when I do that, or not. Ask Carl Sagan, or well, he's no longer with us, but uh, Hitchens or whomever, you see. I guess that would be the, the, the quick initial, quick and dirty, my sense of, the, of a distinction. Worldview then is a cosmology and a cosmography. But the worldview may tell us something about how things got to be. But the, but the phenomenology of religion goes on to also inject the religious element, which says how things ought to be, and takes the creation story as the, as the, as the originals, whether in China or Mesopotamia or Egypt, or Palestine, Judea, put it, as a, the, the creation story is crafted in a way to set up the categories between clean and unclean by which we know how to live today, you see. It's much less about answering questions about origins and about the grid through which we see life today. The water above, the water below, the dry land, the fish, the birds, the animals, in the, each in their own realm. That's why that's why sun and moon are put on the fourth day, because their their domain is set up on the first day, light, dark, day, night. But in order to keep the pairings, um, sun and moon, their inhabitants to rule the day, have to come on the fourth day too, because it makes the pairings work. Now. How that actually cooks out in students' lives, uh, to go back to the opening part of your remarks, is really interesting. We have typically between 30 and 35 different faith traditions on our campus at La Sierra. Right now, about 35, about 55 percent of our students will acknowledge some background within Adventism. Well, that leaves 45 percent all, all over the map. I remember a few years ago, a wonderful young lady uh, who was sent to La Sierra by her family because they said it's a good place, it's a good campus, a deeply spiritual. I hope we lived up to that. Um, she became so intrigued with her religion as well as ours. She was doubly intrigued by both and saw in Sikhism a number of tallying points when it came time, to, the call was extended for students to volunteer as student missionaries for a year. This Sikh girl came to us. You can see where this is going, right? I would like to go with my friends to Majuro as a student missionary. Could I do that, please? Uh, some on the administration gulped. <laughs> uh, some of us said, yes, welcome aboard. That was the position that carried the day. She went had a grand time. The kids loved her. She loved the kids. Came back, said, I really wish I had time in my life to go again for another year. It's, it's changed my life. I'm a much better Sikh now. See? She still is a Sikh today. Had a big fancy wedding that lasted three days in Los Angeles and married to a nice Sikh guy. And uh, they live happily ever after. You know? So yeah, <laughs> you're right. I took too long answering that, but it was such a rich question, I couldn't resist. John, uh, how about this? Sure, sure, great. Yeah. Thank you, John, for a, a stimulating article and a very stimulating uh, discussion today. Uh, it prompted a lot of questions, so I'll just ask a couple of them. Uh, one is just to notice that the, the root metaphor for pathways is movement, progress, going somewhere. And that leads me to ask a couple of questions related. One is, is uh, or are these pathways pursued by us one by one or with groups in community? Uh, it seems to me uh, a good friend just gave me a card not too long ago that shows uh, uh, a, a beautiful countryside, uh, Southern California countryside, and the silhouette of a solitary figure heading into it. So is that a good model for a religious experience? Uh, what do we do with with the idea of the corporate connection because I have found teaching Christian beliefs for many years that the one element that seems most universally resisted is the idea that if you're really devout, you become part of a community. No, it's something you do by yourself. So that's one. 
Another question related to this is, one, is one of these paths that you have described, these pathways, more precarious than the others? Mm -hmm. Is there one that people are more likely to depart from? And I think you may have answered it, at least my suspicion is, that it's the first one, the path yeah. of the mind. Yeah. And is your illustration of the woman who went into this yeah. place where there were people in desperate physical conditions, yeah. she went there in a sense to find another path yes. than the path of the mind. Yes. Uh, someone I know well uh, was deeply devout, ardent Adventist many years ago, and uh, I think beginning to explore some of the reasons for various beliefs that were held by this community, yeah. found that a number of them didn't hold up right. Uh, right. to careful scrutiny and now has disassociated from the church. So I'm wondering if that in fact, which is yeah. the one I gravitate toward, or the one I try to walk along, is uh, maybe more precarious than the others. Yeah. So. I'd be interested in your reaction yeah. to those. Well, my reaction is that we need to have lunch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Unless we're fasting together or something. <laughs> <laughs> Not my path. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Rick, for thoughtful reflections. And the, 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 the questions are, are, are exactly right. They flow right out of this. The thing about corporate versus individual you are right. Um, I think that when so many students say, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, it's exactly that question that's driving them. Mm -hmm. There is a profound suspicion of, of any corporate authority today, and for good reasons when we look our, around ourselves at the political world and so forth. Um, and so there's a tendency to say, well, I, I've got to make it on my own somehow. Um, that the spiritual, the, the various spiritual options on offer may very well lend themselves to the individual pathway. They may. But they don't have to be. I think the critical issue should always be it, 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 for everyone, it should be individual on a certain level. And it's this. Does this pathway, does this organization advance my spiritual growth? If it does, hallelujah. If it doesn't, I will regard myself as having outgrown it and moved on. And I'm not afraid to say that. But I do believe that ultimately we find ourselves pulled back into community again and again. Um, I don't know that the phenomenologists have much to say about that, but people of all religions across the world consistently say, when you're ready for the next step, you will find the support group you need. That's part of the karma of the cosmos. Now, I know that sounds a little spacey, and maybe for good reason, but I think the potential of shared energy is there in ways that must never be dismissed. Quick, quick illustration, um, as Theravada Buddhism moved up into China and became Mahayana, the main difference between the two was that the Theravada, the old traditional slow way down in India, was an individual pathway. The shared Mahayana tradition was indeed one of shared energy. And the Zendos and the meditation centers uh, in Japan, Korea, and China, all, you can feel the shared energy. It's dynamic. Hurry, hurry, we all have to hurry. Uphold each other, you know. Uh, uh, make your meditation walk around the dojo uh, together, chant, and right back in, and all of us back into position again. There's a shared dynamic about that that pulls. Mahayana is native to people who are energetic and restless, unlike Southern Asia. They have a, they have a different modality about them. Um, and so the question that Mahayana always asks is, how do we speed this up? A lot of experimentation, shouts, slaps,
stamps of the foot, cups of hot tea in the face, um, uh, silly jokes that go nowhere, to drive the man in, mind into snapping somehow. There's that shared energy that you cannot get on your own. That's an illustrative remark, but I think I would always say to any student of mine who sees him or herself on a lonely pathway, even whatever tradition, you, one, one piece of advice, remain open to fellow pilgrims in the same pathway. Don't put them in a box and don't resist them because you all need each other. We need to talk more, obviously, but thank you for a good question. Hi, I don't know if you are doing this on purpose or um, it's an accident, but what you're saying is very, um, makes, um, I think it's very uncomfortable because what you're saying is that what we have here is not unique. Yes. That we don't have it all. That um, this institution that is rich and protects us and has given us all kinds of good things is not in, in itself. And um, what you're saying is a challenge to all of us who are comfortable here and the feel like Christianity or Adventism is very uh, inclusive in all of it. Um, I think you said something in the beginning that religion is to bind. And I think unless you have a shattering experience uh, the binds will not come loose. And in our communities, in our ghettos, we have created elementary school till, um, to, to our grave sites. Why do we have to go out of it? And what you're presenting is that, uh-uh, there is something equally as satisfying outside, um, which is very challenging. I'm sure. First of all, let me amen your question. Thank you. It's one of the most thoughtful and penetrating questions we can ask ourselves. It's a different, there are two questions lurking within it. One is, do we have it all? And the other is, are there valid pieces elsewhere? It's, we can say that we have it all. But the validity of other pieces can cast what we have into sharper uh, profile and deeper understanding. Oftentimes when I take students to visit other houses of worship, as I did yesterday noon to our local mosque in Riverside, when we have a debriefing afterward and the students write their reports, one of the most consistent observations I get is, wow. I didn't know worship could feel so sacred. Because we Adventists worship the divine and we're utterly serious about it, but we have lost a sense of the power and essence of sacredness that we only capture in the powerful moments of silence when all of those rows of people praying together in unison, sweep like a wave, an ocean wave up onto the sand when they all go forward together. And they sense the profound bond, religio, the binding, and the sacredness. They say, I have a better idea of what sacred feels like now. I want that for my church. Bond, and then I think that's it. In Sorry. Boy, Peter's going to have a long one. We better stop right here. Okay. <laughs> uh, I've been too long in my answers, David. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> we need to keep faith with each other. Yeah. Um, a couple of things. One, we need to get the doctor's keto back up front on worldviews. Uh, they know a lot about that, too. Um, Secondly, uh, there will be a memorial service for Bud Racine's wife this afternoon at 4 o'clock at the Redlands Church. And I understand we're all invited. Is that correct, Bud? So um, 
This is a very important moment for all of us. I hope we can be there. Uh, thirdly, as soon as possible, we are going to start the next session and learn about the Exodus. So we've talked about the phenomenology of religion. Now we're going to talk about the archaeology of religion. If you can at all stay by, uh, you will be blessed. I am positive of that. So Forrest, might you lead us in the benediction? Yes, and we didn't do well from memory last week. <laughs> so we're going to read today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.